Hello, everybody. This is Constance from Mysterious Galaxy. Thank you very much for your patience in the world of technology. We had some wonderful technological difficulties, but we are happy to be here with you. Since you are here for the authors, I'm going to go ahead and disappear, and I'm going to let Jonathan Mayberry take it away, and he is going to go ahead and give the introductions. What we are here to celebrate, don't turn off the lights. Yay! A virtual round of applause. And I'm going to now disappear. Jonathan, take it away. All right. Hi, folks. I'm Jonathan Mayberry. I am the editor of uh, Don't Turn Out the Lights, the official tribute to Alvin Schwartz's uh, Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark, which is a book that we all know and love. Um, I have five or four, sorry, four wonderful panelists with me today. We had six, um, then we had five, and now we have four. Others will be at different places. Um, so anyway, I want to ask my panelists to introduce themselves. We're going to start with Amy and work our way down. Amy, just tell us about yourself. Hey guys, um, my name is Amy Lukovic and I write young adult horror. Uh, I have Daughters Unto Devils, The Women in the Walls, The Ravenous, and Nightingale, and I am so excited about this book. I could not have been happier when I was asked to join, and I had the most fun writing my story that I've had in a long time. So thanks for having me, Jonathan. My pleasure. Okay, Kim. Hey everyone, my name is Kim Vincella. I am a middle grade author, so I'm actually not known for horror. I am known for doing more kind of like sweet, tender, heartfelt, might make you cry stories about topics like grief and illness and losing a loved one, but integrating elements of spookiness and more of like a magical realism sort of way to just like further the character arc. So it was really fun to write something that was truly disturbing and just like straight up, you know, eviscerating horror <laughs> for this collection. So I really enjoyed it and super excited to be a part of it. Thanks for having, thanks for joining us too with that. Yeah. Nancy. Hi, I'm Nancy Lambert. I run, I write as um, N.R. Lambert. Uh, I also write, um, nonfiction for Entertainment Weekly and Time and Life and Kids Books. And um, I write horror for Fireside and Pseudopod and Cast of Wonders and a few other places. And I am thrilled to be in this. Um, I was just reading it today. I did not get to read everyone's stories, but I read everyone's here story. So they're very good. They live up to the, to the originals and then some. Cool. Jim. Hi, I'm James A. Moore, AKA Jim. Uh, I write science fiction, fantasy, and horror, but my heart. Oh, you're breaking up a little bit, Jim. I write science fiction, fantasy, and horror, but my heart will always be in the horror field. Cool. Among the things I've written is Seven Forges uh, and the Serenity Falls trilogy. Cool. And, and also stuff in the aliens world. Oh yeah, that's it. <laughs> Ooh. Science fiction. And as I said, I'm Jonathan Mayberry. I write, you know, all over the place, um, different genres, and also I write for Marvel, IDW, Dark Horse, and DC Comics. And um, this book. Yeah, what's that? This this book <laughs> is um, uh, a real work of love. Now, by the way, the, the, if you buy the book. This is not the version you're going to get. You're going to get a hardcover. This is an advanced reading copy, which I haven't gotten yet because COVID has delayed everything. Uh, it is also available on Audible, read by Adam Werner and uh, Hilary Huber. Do a fantastic job. I was listening to it most of the afternoon. And available in ebook. So it's uh, it's fun. It is um, an interesting project that was uh, started by the Horror Writers Association. So it is a Horror Writers Association official anthology. And um, the last one I did and was scary out there, which was a young adult. But this is middle grade. It's a whole different world to write middle grade. Um, I'm going to start off by asking you guys, uh, 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 when scary stories, the original scary stories by um, Alvin Schwartz with wonderful art by Stephen Gremmel, when did these come onto your radar personally? So, Kim, I'm sorry. Oh, my gosh. Um, I vividly remember discovering it in my school library. Um, I think I was in fourth grade, and I, the illustrations are what uh, struck me from the bat, and I remember going home and just could not believe how truly scary the stories were, and like the illustrations were just as scary, if not scarier, and it just had that weird, beautiful combo of being like the 
the illustrations were beautiful, but so dark and morbid. And it was so morbid and I could not get enough of it. And <laughs> then I found out there were more and it made my whole life. And I, you know, proceeded to obsessively check them out as often as I could. <laughs> Yeah, I, the, by the way, the illustrations are, are something, uh, for those who haven't uh, been keeping up with what happened with Scary Stories, the original illustrations were fantastic. And then they put out a sanitized version of it with calmer illustrations because parents were afraid kids couldn't handle it. And that's a topic. But really, the Stephen Grim Grimmel versions, they're, they, they are as scary as the stories. And in some cases, even scarier. I love them. Those illustrations that made me buy that book straight out. Oh, yeah. And uh, read through it in, I think, a week for all three volumes. Yeah. Reading every couple of years now, I just kind of have to. Compelling. So, mm -hmm. Kim, when, when did it come onto your radar? I was same. I was like very young, and just for context, I was like a kid obsessed with all things macabre. Like I would try to fall asleep with my arms crossed, like Wednesday Adams, like I was in my coffin. <laughs> I was like, why? So yeah, I adored it. And the thing that I really adored was that I was also the kid who would get so angry if I read a story that was supposed to be scary. And the monster turned out not to be a real monster. And it was like the Scooby-Doo ending. I would like throw that book across the room. I'd be like so angry because I wanted a book that like reflected what I was going through, which was like a tough, you know, not super rosy childhood. And I needed that moment of catharsis in order to have that, you have to have a real monster. And that's what you have in scary stories. Like there's a mixture, there's some that are just jokes, but there's some where people get like decapitated and these horrible things really happen. And that is actually like helpful and cathartic for me as a child. And so, yeah, that was my experience. And that's why it was fun to kind of go back to that place because I do write middle grade, but you can't always go to that place in horror unless it's a collection where you have a mixture and you have these points of comparison. So some stories are lighter and some are darker. So it's fun to go dark. <laughs> Nancy. Um, I think I was in fourth grade uh, and it might've been at the Scholastic Book Fair. Um, and I, at that point I was in Catholic school. So I I recall there being resistance to selling it to me, but I don't know if it was because it was from the older kids table or because they were nuns, um, but I was hooked. <laughs> and the art, I mean, the art is really the thing that like grabbed me um, right off the bat. And it is when I heard that they were changing the art, I was one of the people on eBay. It was like, I'm going to buy the original books so that no one, <laughs> no one takes that away from me. Um, but I was glad they, they reverted back to the, yeah. the original art. Came to their senses. Yeah, yeah. Jim, when, Jim, since you're you're a little older than the others, not as old as me, but a little older than the others, when did it come onto your radar? Oh, I was about twenty, which is thirty-five years ago. Picked it up again. First book I saw, just for the artwork. Picked up the sequels when they came out, and now I've got two copies of the of the uh, collected three volumes together because mm -hmm. I read the originals to death. <laughs> Yeah, for for me, actually, my my experience with it came uh, is actually in the introduction to our book. I explained that I, I uh, was working as a bodyguard and was on a canoe trip alone in the Jersey Pines, and wanted to read something that would get me scared. And I I, I was brought Salem's Lot. And I brought these, and it, oddly, these kind of creeped me out more. Partly because what Schwartz did, he, you know, these are not all original ideas from uh, for him. He he borrowed from folklore from classic stories and also from urban legends. Uh -huh. Retold them for a younger audience, but didn't necessarily cut a lot of you know corners. I mean, he, he, he wasn't trying to be safe about it. And uh, um, so that, that actually brings me to a quick question then. Um, why do kids love to be scared? And why is it maybe good for them to be scared? And I'll take anyone who wants to jump in on that um. I think for me personally, reading horror when I was young, um, it gave me a sense of like validity to know that people talk about and think about these very sort of dark corners of humanity that aren't often talked about, even when you're an adult, let alone when you're a kid and they want to sugarcoat everything. And um, I have very strong feelings about the whole, the kids can't take real horror thing because I thrived from it. it. I mean, it scared me and I got addicted to that sort of adrenaline 
scare feeling, but I also really like thrived creatively from it. Like I just, I, it never felt like too much. And also I feel like if anyone's reading something that they are not enjoying, they stop reading it. So, you know, certainly no one made me read these books. I, I couldn't read them fast enough. So do you, do you, do you agree that the kids will self-censor? Yes, I do. Now, I which think also kids are, are probably more in touch with the horror of like reality than most adults, you know, like I feel like they cut through the BS a lot and mm -hmm. um, fiction horror is a way to process that, you know, and when the adults are telling them, don't worry, everything is fine. And they're like, clearly it's not fine. And they're picking up on all this stuff. It gives them another way of processing it when the adults around them are not maybe helping them do it. It's a great big scary world when you're a little kid. Yeah. Yeah. Everything is new and everything has the potential to be violent. Yep. Yeah. It's so me, it was always helped by, by, by reading the horror and dealing with the horror along those lines. I ate the horror movies like candy. I read, I read the comic books, the books, everything, and absorbed that. Mm -hmm. Made the world seem more sensible to me. Mm -hmm. yep. And I think like kids are really longing to explore and understand those dark topics. Like I know I uncovered recently this book that I had written when I was like 11 or 12 and it was all about these five adults that lose someone they love and form this club to deal with their grief. And I like illustrated it and the main character like dies in a horrible fire in the last chapter. But I was like really struggling to understand death. And I was right along like around that age where kids can finally like articulate those big questions about the world and they're just dying to understand it. And what books give them is like a framework and a vocabulary to understand those big questions. So it's like vital that we have books about it, whether they're in the horror, horror genre or whatever. But I think that's why I was drawn to these because they do talk about death and they just allow you to pose those questions and it's like a safe space but you also like, so you don't have to be afraid to ask those like really tough and scary questions. And then you also get the catharsis of usually you see someone overcome that evil, but not always. <laughs> yeah, definitely not always in the stories in the book. Yeah, no, not Some in my- Quite badly. <laughs> so, all right, now uh, from the point where I like, we have a mix here of people who I curated and invited in and people who at the time I did not know at all and who, entered through um, an open call. And uh, we, so I wanna ask from the time this book, our book came onto your radar, uh, whether it was something you were uh, invited in or something you said, hey, let me submit to that. What's the evolution of, of it going to the story you actually gave? Um, my first thought was it ended up evolving away from it, but I really wanted to capture like the bone chill that I got reading the Herald story in the originals, the Scarecrow story. And the more I thought about it, uh, I thought if I want to, you know, pay tribute, then the best way for me to do that, I think, would be to feature people who are dead and have no issue saying they're dead and just stating it so plainly, like almost clinically so, how they did in the originals. Um, you know, they wouldn't say, yes, so good. That line about them, uh, you know, putting out a bloody skin to dry in the sun, <laughs> that like, as a kid, I was like, what? <laughs> so I really just wanted to, I wanted to get scary with it, you know? So I tried to do that with my ghost story, but you know. <laughs> Did a good job too. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I was from the open call, but I had actually written this story previously. I was working full time at the library, and I just remember it was this day when I was so frustrated with my boss. And you have that moment of like the frustration has built up and the anger has built up, and you really want to unleash it, but you know that if you unleash that anger and like just exact this horrible revenge that you're imagining something bad's going to happen. So I just like channeled it into the story. And that's really my story is called Jingle Jangle. And that's really what the story is about is like this character who has that moment of like wild, you know, anger that is just totally untamed. And rather than channeling it somewhere 
could they call up, you know, this creature, the Jingle Jangle Man? And so it's kind of like, what would have happened if I would have, like, let that out of my boss at the time? <laughs> so thankfully, <laughs> I did not. But yeah, then when I had this call, my agent, like, heard about it. And she was like, this would be so perfect for you. So I literally, like, joined the Horror Writers Association just so I could submit a story nice. to this person because I loved them so much when I was a kid. Cool. Nancy? Yeah, I um, was also open call. Um, I, when I was heard about it, I picked up the originals again and read through them again um, and wanted to do something that sort of hit on the urban um, legends aspect of them, um, which is why I chose social media as the topic of my story. Um, I, I, I mean, it, I also am a person who does not love how much sharing happens on social media and I can't imagine being 11 and you know like <laughs> this being your entire you know like so much of your social life um so i definitely <laughs> but that would have been a boring story to just be like you guys are oversharing be careful <laughs> cool what about you jim i'm pretty sure there were some threats made to the editor if i didn't get in <laughs> uh, mostly what i really wanted to do was play with the idea of being followed by a shadow. Because I, I think, as a kid, I was fascinated by the very idea. Wherever I went, the shadow went with me. But what if it's not really nice? I really love stories that um, take an everyday, like an observation that you're so familiar with that it's become mundane and then just flips that so that you will never look at shadows the same again, which is what I felt like yeah. when I read that story. Yeah. I was like, oh, Absolutely. great. Something else for 2020 to ruin. Shadows. <laughs> Thanks. Glad I can watch it anyway. <laughs> so we're going to take a question from the chat here. Uh, Shane Hunt asks, he said, uh, how much you guys, did you guys emulate Alvin Schwartz versus going your own way? And how did you make your decision to approach it the way you did? Um, I just tried to honor like the feelings I got as a reader. Um, I knew there's no way I could actually like emulate Alvin Schwartz. Uh, so I, I didn't want to try. I, I never wanted to write a story that read like he could have written it because I wouldn't have been able to do that. <laughs> so I just... Um, just had to keep telling myself, like, you are a true fan of this series and you can write the story that you would have loved to read as a kid. And I just rolled with it that way. And it turned out, I was really happy with how it turned out. Cool. Yeah, see, I had written a story beforehand, but it was a much longer version. And so when I heard the proposal for the anthology, I was like, oh, yeah, this would actually be perfect. But I shortened it, like, this is probably like 25% of the original version, and tried to make it much more like a read aloud, since these are mostly like meant to be campfire stories. So I tried to really keep that in mind. Um, but the story was always that sort of very you know visceral horrifying like the creature with you know body parts like draped jauntily around his neck like a scarf and whatnot so it was always like that type of story but i just really tried to focus on the campfire aspect and making something that would be fun to read aloud cool um i think the um mm -hmm. version that you saw uh, that i submitted had um because the original some of them had like instructions on how to like tell the story or end the story or like clap or stomp your foot and um, I think I had instructions like that at the end uh, in the first version before we went through editing. Um, and that was, um, for me, the closest I think I came to emulating. Like, because I, I knew, like um, Amy said, like, I wasn't going to be able to do it the same way. But um, I did try to, like, capture that um, old school feel of the 80s. The challenge for me is I'm a horribly, horribly wordy writer. And these are very short stories. So basically it was writing the story down, trying to keep the spirit of the originals, and then paring it down to something that could be told in the, in the length of time we were given. Mm -hmm. It's much, much shorter than I almost ever do. That's like the first paragraph lengthwise for me. <laughs> Yes, I, I've I've read all your Seven Forges novels. They are they are hefty. They're workout tools as well as good reads. Um, <laughs> Goals. You know, interesting. When I was uh, reading these as they came in, um, 
part of, of how I decided whether the story was going to make the cut and how I decided what kind of edits I was going to give was reading it aloud. I read each of these stories aloud because I knew that with the original scary stories, they were read not only by kids, you know, around campfires you know, Boy Scout, uh, and Girl Scout camp, camps and so on, but read in classes aloud. Uh, I, I, I know quite a few people whose kids, you know, in school were asked, you know, there were, a kid was picked or volunteered to read a story aloud in class. So they were meant to be told. And if the story read well told, even if it needed edits that, you know, everything needs edits, if it read well told, then it had that, it caught in my excitement. And that's that's how we actually uh, went down the list of uh, open call, because when when we got that, that the batch that I thought were close to what I wanted, um, we originally only had, I think, three slots open. We wound up buying seven extras from open call because we had... We had about 25 superior open call stories and I stretched the budget a little bit to get seven in there. And because those are the ones that read best aloud, even before it, and that, that's exciting to me, isn't it? And from the, the, uh, the people I, I invited in, same thing. Uh, some of the edits I, I gave were, were to friends, you know, uh, colleagues who wrote stories that really weren't meant to be read aloud. Uh, and, and that, you know, there are, there are a lot of rules we can break. That wasn't one of them. Uh-huh. And by the way, nobody in this book tries to write like Alvin Schwartz. And that's one of the things I love about it. Everyone has a unique voice. And it's not necessarily the voice of what you guys normally write. Because I have read a lot of, you know, pretty much something from everyone in the book I've read. This is a different voice. And that, to me, is exciting. And it's the voice of the stories for the book. So that's fantastic. All right, let me, um, so we don't see if we have any other questions. You guys need to hit me with some questions over there. So while we're waiting for those people to have questions, a whole oh, bunch hi, more. Jonathan. Hello? Sorry, just popping in really quick. Constance from Mysterious Galaxy. So we didn't get to talk about this on Crowdcast, but if you hit the ask a question button, you'll see more questions asked by our viewers. Huh? And, oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> um, Allison Escato asks, is there a horror story or novel that you return to? Is there one that you loved but never want to read again? So two different questions. One that you return to and one that's one and done. Um, I return <laughs> to Pet Cemetery. Uh, it is just one of my favorites. I'm trying to think. I don't think I've ever read one that I wouldn't go back to, but I would say The Troop by Nick Cutter, like devastated me it was so sad but so good it's like i can't even say i wouldn't go back to it because i would but that's a hard one yeah that's a tough one especially the ones you wouldn't go back to but i would say so sticking with middle grade um neil gaiman has like my two favorite probably Coraline. Coraline is just one of those beautiful gems and it's one that's actually you know it actually manages to be creepy, like with that little hand, especially <laughs> crawling out to get you. Um, the Graveyard book is not actually you know, necessarily horror. It's more of this like beautiful atmospheric coming of age story, but it takes place in a cemetery with elements of horror. And the first chapter is told from like the perspective of a knife. And that's definitely one of my favorites. And I would love to go back and live in that world all the time. So yeah, I want to go back to those again and again. I'm gonna have to think harder about one that I don't want to go back to. <laughs> That's a tough one. We can circle back. <laughs> um, I I think I've read The Hunting of Hill House probably a dozen times. Um, that was one of my like first entry points into the horror. Um, I don't know. I can't think of one I wouldn't return to. I just. I mean, probably something that really scared me so much that I uh, have blocked it out completely at this point. So it's a, my brain's way of making sure I never go back to it. Um, yeah. I th- I don't by, the, by the way, real, real quick about Haunting of Hill House. Uh, w- when I was a kid, Ray Bradbury said that I needed to read that book. And it's, <laughs> yeah. And so he gave me a copy of it. And I, I, that, I read that when I was um, 12. Uh, that oh, sound awesome. he just heard was my heartbreaking and jealousy. <laughs> it's an amazing story. That is. Yeah, he, he, Ray, Ray was Ray was a great guy. Um, Jim, what about you? One I return to regularly is Ray Bradbury. Oddly enough, something wicked this way comes. Oh yeah. Just warms my heart. What a beautiful story. Uh, one I've read and don't want to read again because I'm afraid it won't hold up as well. 
is the lady at the end by Skip Inspector. Yeah. Great story and I have wonderful memories of it, but I'm not sure if reading it a second time would be doing it justice. Yeah. A lot of what was in there was better the first time for me. Yeah, see, I'm, I'm that way with The Road. Once I got to the end of The Road, I didn't want to read it again, even though I loved the book, because the payoff kind of ends the story for me. The, all the tension of the journey was was resolved in, you know, when that, that kid moves on with the other family. Um, but the one I, you know, I have two books I read every every Halloween week, and one is Something Wicked This Way Comes. Again, Bradbury gave it to me for Christmas. Um, and the other was I Am Legend by Richard Matheson, which I got the same Christmas by from Richard Matheson. And every year I'll buy new copies of those books, read them, and then donate them to a library or Lately, it's one of those outdoor libraries people put in their neighborhoods where, you know, you just donate books. Amen. Yeah. But, um, they, Thank you. Books, there are certain books that become like friends. You, you want to spend time with them again. Because, I mean, we, we read, most of us read a lot of the, our favorite books when we were kids. And, you know, we're different people now, especially as writers. We, we have insight into it. And that, that changes often the read as well as, as the pleasure. Oh, yeah. Big time. Question from Carol Gazander. How do you decide what is scary enough but not too scary for this age? Hmm. No such thing as too scary. For this age, maybe like too again. like gory, but that wasn't as much of a challenge somehow, even though I usually am quite gory in my stuff. But this, uh, this one, it felt easier to kind of stay away from that and try to just focus on that spook factor, you know, that cold chill. Um, no such thing as too scary is my vote. <laughs> Just push it to the max. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, so my story for this collection is very gory. But again, when you have a collection, the kids can pick and choose what they read so you can get a little scarier. But I think in general, writing middle grade, the thing that... I always remember is just you want to end with hope. There's such a strong sense of hope no matter what you're writing. So it's a little bit different from adult horror where usually even if you defeat the monster, you're left with this lingering sense of dread and nothing will ever be the same. That's usually not the case with middle grade. Usually yeah. at the end, you are left with a hopefulness a lightness and that's kind of a difference but this was fun because in a short story you don't have to do that because they can go to the next story to find the hopeful <laughs> the hopeful yeah yeah i think i kept a um i implied a lot of things without showing them on the page which i i think i also appreciate sort of in my in, when i'm reading horror myself like even in the haunting of hill house there's so much implied but you don't see a lot that actually you know you know, in detail. So I think when I'm writing for kids, especially middle grade, I try to, um, one, make sure pacing is kind of snappy and then um, make sure that, you know, if it's going to be like too gory, like Amy was saying, that it's kind of like walk that back a little bit. Yeah. Jim? I like to go for the throat, but I don't like to go for the bloody throat. I want to scare them as much as I can. I don't need the gore. If you have to resort to gore, it's almost a cheat sometimes. I'd rather have them looking over their shoulder wondering what that noise was than knowing what that noise was. Yeah. Um, and one of the things about these stories, um, and I've, I've, one of the, when I was getting ready for this, this series of panels and for the launch, which stays our launch, I reread all the stories. And um, one of the things I found out about them is they, they, they read well again. Um, and even though we know where it's going to end, these are stories that you actually can go back because they read well again. And that makes it fun, even even to a, to a degree of, of of kind of macabre anticipation, knowing where the, the writer you got writers are taking this. I had a lot of fun with your stories, guys. Okay. Um, Thank you. All right. So uh, John Odin said, which horror story that hasn't been made into a movie would you love to see it adapted? Not one of your own. Uh, oh, I have to look up the name of this one. <laughs> Hmm. I don't even know if it counts as um, I would love to see A Head Full of Ghosts by Paul Tremblay on the screen uh, from what I've read we might get that eventually um, also uh, The Troop by Nick Cutter I think would translate really well to the screen yep um, N.K. Jemison's The Evaluators, which was in Wired um, like 
four, I don't know, time is irrelevant, four years ago, I think. Um, yes, 2016, it's online, you can read it there. It is so creepy, and I think about it all the time, <laughs> and it's not even, it, you know, there's just aliens, I don't know if it counts as horror, horror but um, that's the one I would love to see, it's a movie or a show or something. Cool. Uh, <laughs> I just wanna add really quick, also a standout to me that has a lot of stories in it, but so many of them are just like so good, you wanna see them on screen, is uh, the anthology Hark the Herald Angels Scream. Uh, it's a holiday it's anthology, but, oh yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I mean, I like, I loved that so much, and uh, that was like a very cinematic reading experience, I guess you could say. Cool. Jim? Christopher Golden's Wildwood Road. Nice. And virtually everything F. Paul Wilson has ever written. All of his stuff with Repairman Jack needs to be made in movies. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, uh, one of my favorites is is one that, that you just don't see anyone going near to make a film out of um, is Shadowlands by Peter Straub. I mean, yeah. they, they made Ghost Story, but Shadowlands, which is a far more fascinating and psychologically complex story where you don't know if not only if the, if the narrator is unreliable, but whether you are unreliable as the reader because it's a bit of a mind twist, kind of like Haunting of Hill House. Every time I've read that, I have a different opinion as whether it's a psychological drama about disintegrating psyche or a ghost story. Yeah. I, I flip on. Okay, next question. And these, these are all good choices, by the way. Um, Teal James Glenn asks, when, when you're looking to write YA or middle grade, how do you approach the editor with the limit? I just go for it and let them tell me if it's too much. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I was talking about like content and like topic that might be taboo again. And, and any version of the limit. Yeah, <laughs> the limit. Um, yeah, I mean, just write, you know, read a lot so that you're very familiar with it because it does take like a lot, like being very well read in middle grade because it is different from YA. Um, but just, you know, write the book of your heart and remember kids can handle it like kids are so savvy kids need to read these books that are very honest and they don't want you to talk down to them um so yeah write it and see if it flies and probably the more honest you are the better cool nancy yeah i agree with, um i think write what the story needs um to be a good story because uh, Kids deserve that just as much as adults do, um, good narrative. And then if, you know, when you're working with the editor, if, if there's a problem, they'll raise the issue. Um, I think if you write what's going to both evoke the emotions that you want and also entertain, especially for that age bracket, you're probably in a good zone. You're probably okay. Cool. Jim? I agree with that. And to be entertaining first, and then I'm hosting a at a PG-13 language scale. Can drop a couple F-bombs if you must, but not too many. Other than that, <laughs> we'll get her to me. Well, don't drop any F-bombs in the middle, grade. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. And but, sorry, but. But, but it, 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 to a degree, it is the eight, your agent or your editor's job to, you know, to work with the marketing department to let you know if something is crossing a line. But even then, there's often room for conversation. I've had some push back, but, you know, won the arguments for the most part. Uh, I was at an event once, once with uh, Paolo Bagliabucci, who wrote The Shipbreaker, that series oh. of, of YA novels, and we were in a room with 500 librarians and had to defend, and this is down in Texas, had to defend why our books had some adult or written content. But what we found is that when you explain the, the, the textual context, I mean, like, why these these elements belong in the story, people get it, if you explain it to them. And then they wind up becoming kind of the sales force for some of so, And that was, a, that was part of the Scholastic Book Fair event. Huh. <laughs> um, okay, so Bridget McGovern uh, asks, scary stories are such an amazing gateway into the horror genre for so many readers, but I'm interested in hearing if there were other particular books or movies that really stuck with you from a young age and inspired your interest in horror stories over the years. And are there any standouts that uh, for you all? Other than what we already talked about. Uh, when I was very, very young, Goosebumps sort of helped 
gently guide me into the <laughs> scary zone because they were creepy or whatever, but they also had like a sort of comical element to where you never got too afraid. Um, that led me into scary stories. It's tell in the dark. And I mean, and then I feel like you just go from that to like carry. <laughs> there, wasn't, there wasn't much like in the way of uh, like, you know, going slow, slower into that. Maybe the fear street series that had people dying and stuff. Um, yeah. But I I ate all that stuff up too. And by the way, Arl Stein, Bob Stein, who wrote wrote those, is in our book. And yes, was on, was on a panel with us last night. So uh, the coolest. <laughs> yeah, he's such a great guy. Kim, what about you? Yes. Oh man, yeah, it's tough because like when I was a kid, there wasn't really the same categories of like middle grade and young adult. There wasn't such a huge like selection that we have now. So what I remember reading as a kid was like all the Agatha Christie's, like biographies of people I was obsessed about, like Al Capone and like Billy the Kid and just learning about these real people. Um, so I don't know, I can't really think of another like scary book that was intended for kids that I really loved at that age. And that's probably why I was so obsessed with the scary stories books because I hadn't really seen anything like that before. And so I just, yeah, I just loved it. And the visuals and the visuals for this book, by the way, in my mind, like really match Stephen Gamble's, like the beautiful, just like ethereal, like stunning, haunting quality of them. It's all there. I love it so much. I want like yeah. posters yeah. of it everywhere. <laughs> It's yeah, we, we we were very fortunate to have Iris uh, Campiet, who's our um, she's an artist from the Netherlands. Um, she is amazing, and it, it's the closest I've ever seen to Gremmel's style. And we we looked at a lot of different artists for this, and mm. it's you know I actually had a fight to get art for every every story, but she yeah. came through with some really creepy stuff. So it's yeah. really good. They're so good. Yeah, yeah, uh, stunning. Okay, uh, Nancy, do you? Have oh, um, so Christopher Pike, um, I love. I ate up everything that he had, but I think I read "Remember Me" a lot. I have like two copies of it, and one of them is from the library. So I <laughs> maybe didn't return it, but I'm going to say I bought it at a book sale. Um, Lois Duncan, um, uh, I think I don't know if I just want to talk about *A Wrinkle in Time*, but that book has some like really scary parts to it. And I was, that was like the first like novel I was obsessed with um, as a kid. And um, movies, I don't know, my parent, I accidentally caught like a glimpse of The Shining when I was like eight and kind of like really was turned off by like the film side of that <laughs> until much later in life. I think I didn't start really watching horror movies until I was a little older because that was just like too much for me. Cool, Jim. Well, I was weaned on the old horror movies, but uh, fiction-wise, it was definitely Bradbury and Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah. Those, oh, those are my favorite. Yeah, yeah I, I was big into the Victorian stuff, you know, M.R. James, and and uh, oh yeah, a, a lot of that stuff. And also, I got involved. I got into Weird Tales when I was a kid, and the EC Comics and and that sort of stuff. And I, you know, when I was a kid, I, I grew up in the in the sixties. I was born in the fifties, grew up in the sixties, so. The original Outer Limits was on, oh. and yeah. Twilight, Zone, Twilight Zone was just starting its first round of, of reruns, so I got to see those stories. So I was kind of doomed to do, to, to do this. <laughs> oh, and the uh, Night Stalker. What? That? Oh, the Night Stalker. The Night yeah. Stalker. Oh my God, that original movie scared the crap out of me. Um, so Carol Gazander has another question. The stories are all fairly short. How did that affect the way you told the story or focused in on the scope? Um, I just, I kind of kept in mind it needed to be shorter, but I just wanted to write it, see where it was at, and then trim or add as needed. And I, I just so happened to fall within the suggested range. So I was like, yes, <laughs> I didn't feel confined or anything like that. Good. Yeah, for me, it was kind of tough because it had started out as maybe a 
six or 7,000 word story because I'd written it before I read about the anthology. And so trying to trim it down to closer to 1,500 words was definitely a challenge. But it's always been, you know, you see like what really needs to be there and trying to make it more like a read aloud and just more kind of lyrical and have that sense was, I think it helped actually because that type of story tends to be really short. So I was just really thinking like, what would I need to read this around the fire? Nice. And your story was really like impactful in that way. Like it, it was like a sharp punch. I loved it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. I haven't had time to read everybody's, but I'm going to read them like immediately. After <laughs> they're, the they're a whole lot of fun. I love knowing that it was about a boss though, because even knowing how yeah. it ends, I still might make that deal. For <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. His hatred and anger, <laughs> like this needs to happen. He did not care. <laughs> I mean, thank goodness I was able to channel into that story and not like invoke some ancient evil in real life. Because I was like, yeah, nice, Jim. I uh, I write much longer again, so it was an interesting challenge for me. I had to cut a lot to make it work, and I think I got it exactly the maximum word count. You did. You were exactly. <laughs> You were the only story that was exactly 1,500 words. I was, I was very impressed. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we had an interesting question from Judy uh, Broncala. A lot of writers drink while they write. Do you, um, <laughs> you and if you do, do you celebrate uh, afterwards or not drink at all? Interesting question. Uh, I mean, I have before. It's... Um... It's not like an all the time, every time I write, I must drink thing, but you know, like it's fun sometimes. <laughs> I love that Jonathan like took a drink. As a <laughs> Everyone take a shot. <laughs> <laughs> I wish, I know. Um, I will say like before the whole pandemic happened, I was trying to be like very cool and get myself in a cool writing atmosphere and go write in bars and stuff. And it was actually really because like super dark, like dive bars and you're just like in the back, like typing away. <laughs> um, but of course I have not been able to do that lately. And I usually don't drink, but that's just because I'm really cheap. And so, <laughs> and I usually only drink if I go out and I haven't been able to go out since like March, like all of us, so. <laughs> Um, I feel like as I've gotten older and I can no longer have more than like two drinks without getting very sleepy, um, it's not conducive <laughs> to writing. Um, I love writing in bars, like the atmosphere, but I'll nurse something for a long time. Um, I'm more of a coffee person, probably to my detriment. I, I'm like, is this my third pint of coffee today? Oh, well. <laughs> Down Why can't hatch. I sleep at night? I don't understand. <laughs> Jim? I think you're breaking up a little bit. Uh, I held a guy off the ground by the throat and he was unconscious when I was 18 and pretty much gave up drinking right then and there. So coffee for me. Yep. And you drink soft drinks when you're at bars with your friends. At Dragon Con, yep. we, all, we all sat around. The, the, the Dragon Con's this big uh, fan base convention, 80,000 people in Atlanta. It's supposed to be next weekend. And... Um, Jim, Chris Golden, and I would would often meet at the Weston Bar where all the writers meet. Jim was the sober one, the responsible <laughs> adult in the room. Yeah. Um, now, Judy also asked, "Where do you find the open call for this anthology?" And I can ex uh, I'll explain part of that, and those who did the open call can explain the other part. Um, an open call is usually published on websites um, run by whatever organization. So it may be a publisher's website, the freelance editor's website, their social media platforms. Uh, with ours, we kind of blanketed everything, and uh, the Harvard Association used its its mostly its social media, its newsletter, and its uh, website to kind of get the word out there. But how uh, how did you two guys uh, um, find it? Um, so I went to my uh, first HWA convention, the StokerCon, um, that year on a sort of a last minute trip that I planned. And that's where I heard about it. They mentioned it there. And I don't even know that I was a member yet at that point. Or maybe I had to be to go. No, I think you can no, just yeah. go. Yeah, you can just go. So I think I bought my membership after that um, with the intent of 
sending in my story. And then I ended up meeting this amazing community of people in New York who write horror, um, who are my friends now. So it ended up as a win-win. <laughs> cool. That's so cool. Yeah, for me, I usually just write novels and I've never really done short stories, but I had randomly written some middle grade horror short stories and I asked my agent, you know, do you have any idea what I can do with these? And so she just asked around and happened to hear about this. So it was really just for my agents. I'm really glad I happened to hear about it like in just the perfect timing. It was right before the deadline and like thankfully I like joined right away and just submitted it. And so it just worked out perfectly. Fun. And there's actually a question uh, for me. I'll, I'll, I'll give a quick answer. It says, John, do you envision this as a series like the original Scary Story series or is this a one-off? Well, a lot of that will depend on how many of you folks go out and buy the book. <laughs> because, you know, the, these days with you know the economic downturn and COVID and everything, uh, book sales are, you know, really critical for what, you know, for whatever we do next. So, you know, support the book and buy, you know, Christmas is coming. Buy it for a lot of kids that you really want to scare the crap out of. <laughs> Or creepy kids like we were, so that yeah. you, you appeal to our better nature. Um, okay, so that's, we don't have any extra questions at the moment, but I've got a couple extra. Uh, and be also, before we get to the, the last, uh, you know, where we have everybody say where they're going to, uh, where we can find you, but why do you like horror? I mean, what is it that appeals to you, you know, then and now about horror? Because a lot of people who don't get uh, like horror don't get why we like horror. So why? Uh, I think it just goes along with what I said earlier about uh, getting to explore topics that aren't uh, so much talked about in mainstream conversation. Um, and I also think that horror is a really good place to explore like real world issues, character things like humanity. Uh, like the darker parts of humanity, uh, you, I feel like, have a little more freedom to explore that when you're uh, writing, reading, or watching horror. Uh, and that's just always appealed to me so much is it horror doesn't shy away from being real, you know, and uh, it's very effective if you, if, if your heart's open to it. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I think for me personally, it's really, it's just that cathartic release. Like after you watch it and you've gone through all of this and you've come out the other side and you survived, I feel better about everything in my life. Like, well, I can face anything now. <laughs> yes. Down, you know, the most horrific thing imaginable. And I've always been really drawn to the visuals too. So just like the artwork in this collection and just watching, you know, something like the the new versions of it. The thing that I took away from that movie was, yes, I mean, they dealt really well with the characters in the first one, um, with the kids, but the visuals, like I can just picture the clown and the colors and the balloons. And it was so gorgeous. Like I've always thought the macabre and the horrific was like, had this strange beauty to it and i've just been drawn to that imagery so i take that away as well nice uh, i think it's uh i want to echo what everybody said so far um i agree completely i also think for me it's um sort of a like a way to channel um i'm a i was always in a i mean i have an anxiety disorder i was that way since i was a little kid and i did not have an outlet for it that was you know um you know, they didn't even recognize it when I was a kid. So like, um, that was a way, you know, you can't go around, I mean, you can, but probably shouldn't go around the world screaming at how horrible everything is. <laughs> um, especially, you know, in a year like this where things are pretty grim for a lot of people, you, you, it's a way to sort of discharge that buildup of mm -hmm. tension in a safe space, even if no one is safe in the book and maybe nobody makes it out alive, <laughs> you know, like it's a, a safer way of, getting rid of that energy, I think, or dealing with that energy, maybe. It's not getting rid of it. Fantastic. Jim? Some people look forward to Christmas. I always look forward to Halloween. Love Halloween. My entire life I've loved horror. Uh, for me, my grandmother was basically an old lady version of Luna Lovegood. <laughs> Believed in everything. Oh. Born, born, born on Halloween, you know, bought me a black wow. puppy when I was a kid. I loved her to pieces. And she taught me about all the monsters. So I, I monsters were my friends in the stories, you know. Yeah. Um, but interesting, I got texted a question, not, not on the chat here, but actually a text question that kind of relates to something I just said. 
Um, uh, Bill uh, O'Connell asks, do you relate more to the monster or the monster hunter? Probably the monster. Uh, just because, I don't know, I it's a little different as an adult now that I have discovered there are lots of fellow freaks with me here. <laughs> but when you're a kid and you feel that way, it can sometimes make you feel really isolated and different. And um, I did often find myself feeling bad for some of the monsters. <laughs> like, oh, he just wants to like live in the lagoon, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> monster gonna monster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's it. I think it, it really depends on the story and my writing is probably very different from my reading so in my writing the monsters tend to be different versions of death but my grim reapers are more like death doulas that are sort of like gently leading the characters toward death um or my second book bone hollow is kind of from the perspective of one of these like death doulas so, I would say like, yes, the monsters are definitely relatable and the monster in Bone Hollow is the main character and the point of view character. So I definitely, <laughs> that's who I relate to. Um, so yeah, probably the monsters more so. I cool. love Death Dula. That's a great term. Yeah, yeah. same. <laughs> that's our uh, second portable one right now. Monster got a monster and Death Dula. We're good. <laughs> Hashtag Death Dula. Uh, I would say monster. I think especially... Um, I don't know, the way that I was raised as a girl, in the time I was raised as a girl, like there was not a lot of, um, you weren't allowed to be angry, um, especially in my family. There was no, there was no um, talking about like the bad stuff. It was only happy times, happy times, happy times. So like, I think that a lot of times I misidentified, you know, natural anger is making me a monster. And I think um, a lot of the books that I read were sort of misunderstood monsters or, haunted houses. <laughs> um, and I think that's probably, I don't know, it would depend on the story, but most cases, probably the monster, team monster. Cool. Jim? I went to 17 different schools and 12 years of schooling, and I was always the outsider. Of course, I'm with the monsters. <laughs> nice. All right. Um, so Wait, Jonathan, what about you? Oh, for me? Yeah. Uh, actually, even though I loved monsters as a kid, I... I I'm, when people ask me why I write about monsters, I really tell them I write about monster people who hunt monsters. I it's kind of my my pathology. I was I was in an abusive household and so on, so I had my monsters and I read stories where the monsters were defeated. You know, kind of a psychology one hundred and one right there. But uh, there are exceptions. You know, Frankenstein's monster, uh, uh, the creature from the Black Lagoon, Gorgo, one of my King favorite Kong. King Kong. Yeah, I mean those monsters were definitely being abused by humans. And if they push back, well, you know, you should not poke that, you know. So um, two quick questions, and then we're going to wrap. One, it, th this is such a fun book, but I always like suggesting a book that somebody else should either buy if they're in a bookstore or, or pick up at a library if they're grabbing this from the library. What book would you suggest kids get, other than one of our own, when, when they also buy this? Or if you're a parent buying it for kids? What's the, the book to give them along with this? And, and obviously, I, I just read this middle grade horror called um, This Town Is Not All Right. It's by M.K. Chris. And it is like so good. It's about uh, uh, twins who lost their older brother. They moved to Driftwood Harbor. It's like an old fishing town. And something in the town is not right. All the kids are acting a little too perfect. But it's very, very creepy, very awesome. And I would 10 out of 10 recommend it. <laughs> that is awesome. Um, I would recommend a book that actually just came out today as well by middle grade author Lindsay Cray called Scritch Scratch, the author of The Peculiar Incident on Shady Street. So if you love, it deals, dives into like Chicago history, ghosts. If you love ghosts and like haunting stories, it's very creepy. It's right in line with this book and same release day. So Scritch Scratch. Nice. And by the way, before before Nancy you jump in, every book that we've talked about, the links to where you can purchase them at Mysterious Galaxy are right along in the chat function. So you can go and just grab, you know, buy what you want, including this book. Nancy, what about you? 
Um, I'm glad you said that because I needed time to look up the title. <laughs> um, it was called <laughs> Thickety, um, and it is a dark fantasy, I guess. Um, the monsters are super creepy. The um, people are even creepier uh, in this town that may or may not be part of this world. So I think right. it's a really good dark book. Cool. Jim? Stephen King's The Shining. And okay. Stephen King's Salem Lot. To me, two of the best monster books ever done. I would have read that when I was a kid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely. Well, I, I was 13 or 14 when I read it. Um, that was when the Stephen King really, the trend in my circle of friends began. Nice. For, for me, um, it's, it's a book that isn't necessarily scary, but is just a wonderful book that, that is filled with magic and, and, and a simplicity of storytelling is Dandelion Wine by Ray Bradbury. Yeah. It's one of the Great. best books ever written. And you can um, never go wrong with Bradbury in my book. No, you really can't. But of all, even though he gave me something uh, wicked, Dandelion Wine is actually my favorite of his books. Uh, it's one that I've give, gifted to kids and to friends who have a childlike acceptance of, the, of magic. I've gifted so many times over the years. It's a great book. Amen. So we're we're uh, uh, now, before we get into the last part of this, since we're all in different parts of the country, now, I, I live close to the Sears Galaxy, so if anybody wants a copy of Don't Turn Out the Lights, my book, signed by me, the store will contact me, and I'll put on a mask and drive over there and literally sign the books. What about you guys? Uh, which bookstore should we like to direct people to if, you know, if they want signed copies from you? Um, Peregrine Book Company in Prescott, Arizona. It is my local indie, and they are fantastic, and I love them, so... <laughs> Support them. <laughs> um, I'm in Oklahoma City, and you can go to Best of Books, super amazing, or Full Circle Bookstore. Cool. Uh, I'm in Queens, New York, uh, so I would say Astoria Bookshop or Cuban Willow Books um, are both excellent and ship anywhere. Yep. Jim. And I am flat-footed. I don't have an answer for you. <laughs> I can't think of the name of the bookstore to save my life. Yeah, you live out in the middle of no damn where, so what, what can I say? <laughs> um, and for me, it's Mysterious Galaxy, and uh, it's it's just a wonderful indie. I'm, we're all clearly big fans of, of indie bookstores here. Um, yes. Not there's anything wrong with, with chains, but indies, the reason I love indie bookstores is because the people who work there actually know the books. They, yes. can't, they don't just know what shelf they're on. They can have a conversation with you. I've had some of my best recommendations uh, for books to read, including some really scary new voices. Mm -hmm. From Mysterious, um, Victor Laval is a good example. Oh yeah, uh, I, uh, a friend of mine who's who's involved with um, with Mysterious Galaxy, Rob Crowther, said this is a novella you've got to read, and you know bought on his recommendation because the books, the indie books, are people know the books, and fell in love with it and went up uh, buying a story for him for Weird Tales magazine. Amen. Oh, I love it. Okay, so we're going to wrap with it's a kind of an obvious question, but it's a it's an important one. Where can people find you? Uh, I'm on Instagram, Amy Lukovics, and also my website, amylukovics.com. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, kimbenchella.com, kimbenchella on Instagram and Twitter. Nancy? Um, my website is nrlambert.com, or I'm at nambits on Twitter. Jim? jamesamorebooks.com, and on Facebook at jamesamore1. Okay. Same with Jonathan Mayberry. Just spell my last name right. It's M A B, not M A Y. Um, and I'm on, you know, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, and I have a website with my name on it. Uh, so this this was fantastic. You guys, you guys are great. And uh, it's always Thank fun you so much chatting for with. Us. Oh my Thank pleasure. You. It's always fun chatting with, with kids who would have been the other weird kids in the playground. <laughs> oh yeah, uh, for sure. That, that's that's the best crowd. You know, so, and, and thanks to everyone who, who uh, posted questions and tuned in. Yeah, and of course, it's free archive for you know if you want to share the link with uh, other friends, and go by. Don't turn out the lights. The official tribute to scary stories to tell in the dark. Yes. Thank you so much, guys. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. We're going to go ahead and log off, but just to let you guys know, too, for the direct link to go and buy this awesome, amazing book, because it's its book birthday, and how else would you want to celebrate it? There is a books available button down below, um, and like Jonathan said, he can sign those guys for you. But thank you so much to all of our amazing authors mm -hmm. and have a wonderful evening, everybody. Goodbye. Bye, Bye guys. Bye. 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 <laughs>